Hi, this is Daniel, and you're watching Unrivaled Investing. This is a no-hype financial channel that is mission-focused on finding exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. Today, I'm excited to bring you Uber, ticker U-B-E-R, name is the same as the ticker. The stock is up about 50% in November 2020 alone, which is primarily due to sort of hopes about a vaccine responding to COVID. And this is sort of becoming a post, you know, COVID play. And I think that's the reason why it rallied so much along with a bunch of other post COVID plays like travel. Um, but prior to COVID, Uber was a compounding machine where they grew bookings going through their platform from 19 billion to 65 billion in about three years or about 50% compounded. Um, and so this is a super interesting company. I actually had never done a deep dive on Uber. So I want to do a thank you and a call out to Aaron, who is an Unrivaled Investing Journey subscriber who asked me to look at this. So I'm making this happen. This video goes out to Aaron. But before digging in, a quick 10 second plug. If you enjoy learning about potential multi-baggers, make sure you subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, I appreciate the thumbs up. And if you want to follow my personal journey to try to find potential multi-baggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. All right, now let's go in. So what is Uber? Uber aims to become like a super app, like a super functional app um, where you have mobility going from point A to point B, delivery where it's like if you need something delivered, almost anything, that's sort of the goal over time, they're going to be, you know, they're looking to deliver it and you have Uber Eats and it's really turning into a platform where they're targeting things like grocery store and pharmacy longer term. So let's get into their mobility app first because that's, that's what a lot of people are mentally associating with in terms of Uber and that's historically their largest piece of business. Um, there are so many different ways of getting around on the Uber app. I mean, this is a, first of all, it's a global platform, um, but you you have Uber X where you have a ride all to yourself, Uber Pool where you can share it with other people and it's much more affordable, Uber Comfort with extra leg room, Uber Green if you wanna be able to, you know, make sure you get that hybrid or that, that clean environment you know, environmentally friendly car, which I, I love the fact that they're constantly building out new functionality with their business model. This is not a management or a team that's just sitting on their bet, but trying to make, you know, this company grow. They are actively trying to do new things. Uh, Uber Black, um, premium rides and luxury class cars. Then they're, they're partnering with bikes. They're partnering with scooters. There's Uber XL for larger groups. Then they're working with transit. They acquired a company to help assist with you using mass transit. So that way you can figure out what's actually the best solution. Um, Uber for wheelchair accessible, Uber luxury, Uber black SUV, and more. They have Uber taxi to work with the taxi system, Uber flash. So that way you can get the closest taxi Uber Uber X as soon as possible if you're in a rush. They have Uber auto, which you can't see here, but that's like little rickshaws that you can get in, in India. They're working on Uber air, like a little like uh, flying Uber effectively. I'm personally waiting for the Uber Jetpack. That's what I'd sign up for. But there is Uber Moped in some markets where you can just hop on by and, you know, like, hey, I, I want this. Well, I want someone in a moped to take me around. So it's it's a really amazing that they are just trying to saturate the market. If if there's a need to go from point A to point B, they want to have you covered. Um, you know, they want to meet your need. And this is really interesting because it creates a really important flywheel in terms of these dynamics where, you know, you start off with this dr driver supply. The more drivers you get, the lower the wait time and the, the more affordable the fares. That results in more riders because they have a favorable experience. More riders equals more money per ride, you know, more demand for cars. So then more drivers get on the platform. So you get this virtuous cycle as more and more drivers come online, more and more riders come online. And ultimately creating this sort of marketplace, this two-sided marketplace dynamic makes it really challenging to unseat them as a competitor. Like you would have to spend millions upon millions of dollars to, to have driver incentives just to start competing with them in some markets. So this creates a really strong competitive advantage and also creates a win-win dynamic where, you know, like the consumers, you have this ease, you have affordability, like you just at the Ted, if you taps on your phone, you have a car coming to you, you know, depending on how much money you want to spend or what your needs are, you can have a more affordable solution. Um, you can, it has the reliability of showing you approximately how much time it's going to take you to get there. There's safety aspects like, hey, 
you know, you don't know who your taxi driver is like until you open the door. Whereas here you can see, oh, this is a 4.9 stars. They got great reviews. Like I'm confident that this is going to be a, a fine ride. This isn't going to be a serial killer. Um, you know, from the drivers, it's a win as well, you know, because you have flexible schedule. And in California, you know, it was overwhelmingly voted to be able to keep, you know, being able to work, continue working as contractors um, where they enjoy this sort of lifestyle of flexible schedule and earnings either as a main hustle or a side hustle. And there's also reward programs and sort of incentives that Uber puts in place. And then also it helps the communities where, you know, like, hey, you can figure out what's what's best for traffic. Oh, you you it, it because it plugs in with mass transit, you can figure out like maybe it makes sense to do that. Or it could be good for the environment to be in an Uber pool where you're sharing with multiple folks. This is obviously like post COVID or, you know, or pre COVID, however you want to look at it. Um, and also like a key element is, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, alcohol related deaths were something like 30% of all traffic related fatalities um, historically. And so if you're able to create a model that helps tick that away, you're saving lives. So I view this as a win for the communities, ultimately win for the drivers, win for the consumers. Um, you know, and, and I love the fact that you can get an Uber green car. Like, hey, if, if you want to say, hey, I want to save some money and or excuse me, not save some money, I want to save the planet and not not have all this diesel or gas is going in the environment. Great. Like maybe you pay up a little bit and you're you're getting that that Prius. So I I love the fact that they offer that option and that they're, they're just continuing to offer more and more options for users. Um, now, what are the economics of mobility? And user, you know, Uber mobility is actually a profitable business. And that's that's a part that shocked me. Like my my preconceived notions going into Uber was, you know, you, you have previous management that seems like a jerk. Um, he's been replaced, so don't really know much, you know, like learn about the new management, impressed by the new management. Um, but is this a dumpster fire that's just burning lots and lots of money? And if you look at the high level, you see that, that they're losing lots of money. But when you peel back the layer, it actually starts getting more interesting. Like Uber Mobility, were on the fourth quarter 2019, so before any sort of impact of COVID, there are 55 billion in bookings going through their platform or about a 13 billion revenue. So the way to think about it is that the money that goes through the platform pre-COVID was around $55 billion and they get a little over 20% cut. Long-term, they think that'll be closer to 25, which I'll talk to you about in a second. So for every dollar that goes to their platform on the mobility side, so getting you from point A to point B, they aim to get about 25 cents of it. So for every dollar. Um, and so that's their revenue. And then they think because of that, you know, like then you can see here's here's their EBITDA margins. EBITDA margins are a proxy for cash flow. I have yet to create an exclusive video just for journey subscribers, but I will about thinking about EBITDA, the pros and cons, and why it's a reasonable measure for cash flow. Um, but you can see how this has fared over time. They obviously took a hit during COVID as, you know, demand for, you know, bookings on their platform dropped 73% in the second quarter, 2020 was down 50% in the third quarter. So, you know, like you can see, this has really had an impact, but it's pretty amazing that despite COVID, they're still at, you know, like 50% of where they were last year. Like that actually blows me away. Um, you know, and, and you could see like, look, pre COVID, they were growing revenue at 30% year over year. They're growing bookings on their platform by 20% year over year. And you could understand, like, look, most of the revenue is going to the drivers, you know, 75%. That's what they're targeting over time. So then this adjusted revenue or this revenue figure, that could be pretty high margin over time. Like they're saying 24% EBITDA margins. What about their long-term potential? And they think their margins could be really really high. You're talking about software type margins, which makes sense. Like this is effectively a tech company that's enabling physical goods in the real world. It's really a tech company enabling physical goods. And so if you're a tech company and you don't have to make these huge investments in physical infrastructure, you can have really attractive margins. Um, and their adjusted EBITDA margin that they're targeting long-term is 45% based on a long-term take rate of 25%. Now in the second quarter, they're at 26%. So like, I think 
long term, this seems very feasible. I mean, that's that's a huge bump from where they were in second quarter, where you know business dropped you know seventy percent. Um, but this strikes me as super interesting for what the mobility segment could be. Do they have an unrivaled value proposition? Because that's a lens I look at all companies. Um, you know, particularly if if you're unrivaled, it means you have the right to win. Or you know, one way of measuring it is: Are you dominating the market that that you're in? And holy smokes, you look at this board and everything in dark blue is owned operations, light blue is minority owned operations, and they are the category winner in almost all the, I mean, all their key markets, like over 65% in US and Canada, Latin America, Europe, um, you know, India, like this is incredible. India is over 50%. You can see some of their, their equity stakes that they have with Yandex, Grab, and DD. Um, when I look at this map, I think of like the game Risk, if, if anyone played that, because it's all about like, hey, do you own this geography? And then if you own this geography, you get more troops. And then you use those troops to buttress, you know, the, the geographies you're looking to take over. And this is, you know, this model, that model has been played out over and over again. And look, you, I have, I have um, behind me, there's a picture of, of John D. Rockefeller. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's right. Uh, it's right over here. Um, and the reason why is it's this model over and over again of, look, you're profitable in one segment, and then you can take those profits, roll it into another. And before you know it, you just squeeze one industry at a time and you just, you dominate. And that's what they can do. Cause it's like, oh, we're profitable here. Let's use those profits to, to beat out the competitors in this market. And before you know it, you're going to have 65% market share in all these markets, you know, Australia, um, Middle East. Uh, so I, I'm, I, this, this seems really exciting to me. Um, super interesting. Uh, it, it suggests they have a super strong value proposition. Like uh, they're they're winning the world value proposition, um, and how big is the market that they're addressing? Like it's huge, huge, enormous. Um, you know, excluding any sort of ex exclude COVID, go back to fourth quarter twenty nineteen, and there are fifty five billion dollars in bookings going through their platform, and they were saying in their S one, so when they filed to go public that they think their serviceable addressable market consists of 3.9 trillion miles per year, representing an estimated $2.5 trillion market opportunity. So $55 billion in bookings versus several trillion in market opportunity, you're talking at least 10x upside potential. And even, even if they were aggressive in their assumptions, you're still talking about multiples of their current size. Plus, this company is an inflation hedge, which I think a lot of people are missing, which is, you know, the reality is, um, most investors, I think, are dramatically underweighting the possibility of inflation picking up, let's say, three, five years from now. But you know what? If inflation starts picking up or it's 5% a year, one, equity prices are going to be dramatically different. Two, um, this is the type of company that gets to pass on that inflation because it means it's going to be more booking. So inflation could actually be a net win for a company like Uber. Like if you get inflation of a couple percent, that's just additional growth because they're probably going to pass that on to the end users because the drivers need to make money and they're going to keep their cut. So it's it's uh, this is a beautiful sort of platform when you think about it. Um, what about Uber Eats? Because I've, I've heard that they're you know doing something there too. So while mobility has gotten crushed in 2020, you know, down 50% plus, Uber Eats has been on fire in fuego. And you can see, you know, how mobility compares versus delivery. This is month one, month 14, month 28. Like Uber delivery, you know, Uber Eats is well ahead of where mobility was for the same time period. Like they're just crushing it, you know, by the same, you know, month rate. Delivery reached a 35 billion annualized um, gross bookings run rate as of August 2020. Um, and you can see like relative to several of their main competitors, they are dramatically outgrowing them like Grubhub, Just Eat, Delivery Hero. And, you know, that's seeing that they're outgrowing. You know, we, we talked about value proposition with, with Uber, which is Uber mobility, which is, hey, you have the biggest market, you have this competitive advantage, this two-sided, more, more users, more drivers, that's gonna be tough to beat. But you're also starting to see that with Uber Eats as well, because as they're taking market share, like that's a key sign that you have a stronger value proposition. 
And, you know, they have a very similar, you know, marketplace dynamic, which is, you know, you have the better, get the best restaurant selection equals more demand, which is more trips per hour. So the driver's getting paid more Then it's lower cost per drop off and then lower fees that you have to charge the consumer. Therefore, there's more demand. Then you get the best restaurant selection because you have the most demand. Um, and then you start getting these national chains because you're a national platform. And then with more density, you get more trips per hour. So the driver, drivers are happy. happy. So you, you see that they there is this really interesting dynamic that's very similar to the mobility aspect. And the reality is their customer costs of acquisition. So acquiring new Uber Eats customers is actually very low relative to some of their competitors because they can just add it right on their app. So if you're on the mobility app, you can just look and be like, oh, you know what? I, I am hungry. And you just click on that button. And they've they've talked about how it's not cannibalizing their business, putting these additional features on their app. Um, and so far, they've built the largest food delivery company outside of China. Um, but there is a big difference comparing Uber Eats to the mobility segment. And I would say it's just much, much more competitive. And you can see how it was, you know, how, how who were the big players in US at least um, in 2018, you know, with DoorDash uh, here, um, and then Uber Eats, and then Grubhub and Postmates, and then other players. And interestingly enough, since then, the market in the U.S. in particular, has this is from the DoorDash uh, S1, has gotten a lot more consolidated, which is interesting, as DoorDash and Caviar have merged. Square sold Caviar to DoorDash. And then you see that Uber Eats has, has, has effectively stayed the same, but they're also acquiring Postmates. That's relatively new uh, in the last few months. So they're taking share. And then Grubhub, Grubhub's been the net loser here where they've gone from 39% share to 16% share. So that, that means to me, they're, they're sort of having a tough time of it. And I really like to see that this environment is rationalizing, but let, let's, let's not be mistaken. This is a much tougher market than mobility. You know, here's, here's from the DoorDash uh, IPO filing. In addition, within our industry, the cost to switch between offerings is low. Consumers have a propensity to shift to the lowest cost provider and could use more than one lo lo local logistics platform. Independent contractors who provide delivery services could use multiple platforms concurrently as they attempt to maximize earnings, and merchants could prefer to use the local logistics platform that offers the lowest commission rates and adopt more than one platform to maximize their volume of orders. In short, no one here is married to each other. These are this is all like, hey, what's in it for me, and uh, you know what's the best deal that I can get. And you know, there's no loyalty here from the consumer side. There's no loyalty from the restaurant side, and there's no loyalty from the independent contractors who are driving it around. That said, the denser your network, the stronger your advantage. So the bigger you are, the more of an advantage you will have. So I, you know, I'm excited uh, to see that, hey, they're going to be one and two player and they are by far a big player globally with Uber Eats, you know, the largest restaurant delivery company outside of China. Um, and to see a rationalizing environment also gets me interested. You know, ultimately, the fewer the competitors, the easier it is to have stable or profitable business. Um, and so how does, you know, how does it look? Well, right now, look, it is still a huge hundreds of millions of dollars in cash burn. Um, but you can see gross bookings has gone nuts. You know, the amount of dollars growing on their platform up 135% year over year in the third quarter. You know, this this business was doing 2.6 billion. Now it's doing closer to 9 billion just about a year later. They're crushing it. Uh, and you can see what their take rate is and how that's slowly going up over time from now. Now keep in mind, this is, this is, let's compare apples, you know, let, let's compare this to mobility where, you know, with mobility, you're taking 25 cents of every dollar here. It's 10 cents of every dollar, which reflects the competitive dynamics. Also the, the inherent, you know, aspects that there's a lot more fees going on with, you know, the, the restaurants also need to get their cut. Um, you have the restaurants, you have this, you have the food delivery platform, um, you know, and, and the driver. So there's, there's, there's a lot more, a lot more fingers in the pie in order to make sure it's, it's still affordable for the consumer. Um, so here it is, you know, the, the take rate's going to be lower at about 13 cents right now uh, for every dollar. And you can see it's just massively unprofitable, you know, to the tune of half a billion dollars in the fourth quarter 2019, but they are improving it. And look, they are tapping into this huge market. You know, they're saying their addressable market is $800 billion. So once again, like I, I love the way management thinks, you know, talking about, look, we're just constantly looking 
for these huge opportunities where we can be a compounding machine. That those are their words, compounding machine for years, if not decades. So I, you know, Eats is also a 10x opportunity as well. So I'm I'm getting excited about this. I see a strong, if not unrivaled, value proposition. I see huge opportunity to grow in the years ahead post COVID. So maybe this becomes a you know a post COVID play and, and it, it you know, trades accordingly. Um, and you can see what the economics for Uber Eats looks like. This is what they think their long-term targets could look like. And they think net on a consolidated basis, they could be profitable by next year on a consolidated basis, um, you know, at the end of next year. And so they're saying, look, the take rate in Eats gets to 15% versus around 13% now. And their EBITDA margin, because once again, this is a tech platform, they can have really juicy margins, is around 30%. So how do you, how do you go from negative 16 to you know positive 30? And the answer is ultimately you get more scale, you have less competition, and you, you get to spend less on marketing initiatives to hire new restaurants, bring new restaurants, bring the drivers on board. You know, once you start getting that scale, you don't have to keep having these one-time deals to make sure the restaurant stays on the platform or that the, you know, that the driver stays stays on board. That's that's the trick. Once you get scale, you can start getting these these types of profit margins. But that's not all. Like there are several other multi-billion dollar bets to deliver anything. Um, you know, they, they're making a bet on grocery. They acquired Corner Shop, which is now over a $1 billion annual run rate in 30 markets delivering groceries. That's incredible. Um, you know, they've also talked about potentially going into pharmacy, um, delivering anything freight. You know, they, they, they're, they're looking to leverage the tech that they have built out across these segments and roll it into these other cool products like freight. Now, admittedly, freight's very different um, because it's ultimately about delivering goods from the warehouse to the store. But look, this business is not inco inconsequential. They've done, they're doing a run rate of around a billion dollars in revenue, a little shy of billion dollars. Um, and what I love and what I really like about what they're doing is they, like for the bets that aren't, I'd say, key, like in their wheelhouse, they're sort of hedging their bets by saying, by raising outside capital for that specific segment. So they raised 500 million at a $3.3 billion valuation just for freight, um, which from a company called Greenbrier, um, which they've indicated is enough to take them to profitability. So i.e. if, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, risking their balance sheet on these other multi-billion dollar bets that are tapping into huge markets. Here they're saying the market for freight, if they can get it right, is $1.3 trillion, you know, if, if, if they can build it out. So, I mean, look, freight is a highly competitive market, very different than what they're currently operating in. But nearly a billion dollars in revenue is nothing to sniff your nose at, nor is a $3.3 billion valuation. I mean, that should get baked in when you're thinking about the, the valuation of, the, of Uber as a company. And also like another bet is autonomous, another similar bet to freight where they raised a billion dollars from Toyota and other players like SoftBank um, to, to fund this. And look, ultimately autonomous is going to revolutionize all of these industries. Um, and they're, they're trying to make a bet of like, hey, can we develop this tech ourselves? Um, and ultimately let's work with several partners because it's important for them as well. Now, is autonomous a deal breaker? Because in my mind, this is going to happen. It's not It's not like if, it's a when is autonomous driving going to happen. I mean, you're already seeing it in Phoenix, Arizona with Waymo, and it's obviously a risk. Like, But we're probably going to be in a hybrid environment for some time. Like, I don't know if you're going to see, start seeing it really like Waymo is offering a service right now, autonomous drivers, you know, in Phoenix, Arizona. So that's one city in the world where you can use an autonomous vehicle. So the question is, is it like the internet where you start off with one city, then a few months later, a year later, you're in two cities, then, you know, you get that X4, 10, you know, 30, you know, you start getting this crazy exponential growth um, that that disrupts the business model. And that's, that's, that's a legitimate risk and question. And I think that's an uncertainty that gets baked in here. Um, but on the flip side, and look, Uber, Uber's also, excuse me, Waymo and Google, they're also interested in tapping into the freight market because they're thinking like, look, an autonomous truck, like this is a multi-trillion dollar industry. And plus, if you if you view freight on a global perspective, then it's just buku dollars. Um, but if if Uber keeps aggregating demand, 
then arguably they're in a solid position because they're like, look, we have the users, the demand generation of, let's say, tens of millions, if not potentially in the future, hundreds of millions of users, hundreds of millions of people looking to get from point A to point B. That should be valuable in a hybrid and potentially fully autonomous environment where when I say hybrid, I mean some of the users on the road are autonomous, some of the users are fully, um, you know, are, are human drivers. So human and autonomous is hybrid. Um, so I, I think as long as Uber keeps aggregating demand, they should have a seat at the table because just because let's say you have this tech doesn't mean you're going to be the one that has the cars on the road that can roll it out. Like you're, you're going to have a bottleneck of how many autonomous vehicles can you have on the road? So then it becomes a question of, well, who's bringing these autonomous, autonomous vehicles to the road? Um, and then, you know, like, and who, who's demanding it? So I think having a platform will be inherently valuable in the years ahead. It will give them a good negotiating stake in the years ahead. And potentially they can, you know, sort of curb and drive the narrative potentially, you know, if they, if they can get to hundreds of millions of, you know, daily users, you know, on their platform, then you really do start shifting, you know, driving where the narrative goes, in my opinion. Um, but it is a risk, you know, it is an inherent uncertainty, you know, where Waymo is talking about, we're building the world's most experienced driver and it's a robot. Uh, and it's exciting. Like it's something to be excited about. I personally look forward to being in an autonomous vehicle someday. Um, what are the thoughts on valuation? Don't get angry at me if I if I don't go full open kimono. I'll show a little bit here. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. So that's that's the first part. Like we got mobility, we got eats, we got freight, we got autonomous vehicle, which they you know they're vesting in. You have some equity interests, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I in summary, I like Uber. Uh, I think they have a strong competitive advantage. I think they're tapping into, you know, I think they have a really strong value proposition from the driver and from the uh, user perspective. I think that that should give them the right to win longer term. They're tapping into these huge markets. Um, this is this is this video should show, you know, regular watchers. I don't I don't, you know, poop on everything. You know, some companies I do like, um, which which is funny. I, some of the negativity people are like, oh, he's dumping on my stocking. And like, look, I'll occasionally give. I I call it as I see it. You know, like I'm not I'm not here to pump. I'm not here to dump. I'm just calling it as I see it, and that's my value proposition to you. Um, you know, I'm trying to be straight with you. Um, and I'm gonna share a little bit of the valuation here. The full thing I will share exclusively for Journey subscribers sometime in December 2020 um, that shows over the full risk reward. But here, you know, currently it's around 50 bucks a share, around $89 billion market cap. Um, and you can see like mobility, I'm just focusing on the mobility segment right now and, and what, what mobility could be worth relative to the whole segment. So if you wanna see the full valuation breakdown, that's gonna be for, for Journey subscribers. But, you know, so, so just looking at mobility, you know, currently Uber's valued around ninety billion dollars. Mobility, you know, did approximately eleven billion in revenue in twenty twenty. You know, this year it's down around fifty percent. So let's say five to six billion dollars. Long term, they're probably at thirty to forty percent operating margins. You know, they they say they say forty five percent EBITDA margins. So I'm saying, you know, let's do thirty to forty percent. You know, maybe being a little conservative on the high side. Um, th throw on some sort of tax rate to that. And then what's the growth rate in the years ahead, 20 to 30% annualized. Um, and you can, you might argue that this is being, you know, too conservative on the downside because it's effectively, you know, up 10% from where they were um, in, excuse me, this, this should say, this should say um, 2019 and this should say 2020. So, you know, I'll, I'll um, yeah. So in short, it should be like, this is, this is showing only up a little bit from where they were in, in 2019. Um, and you know, if you, if you slap on a multiple range to what they could be in five years from now, from 12 billion to 22 billion, which I think, you know, this is being pretty reasonable. This is effectively saying they double from their, their, from 2019's level. Um, you know, and, and you, you take this, this margins of 30 to 40% slap on a multiple 15 to 25 times, which it is a platform. It, Probably like maybe you could argue I'm being too too generous. You know, if if autonomous vehicle becomes a real risk, um, maybe this is too low. 
you know, here at the 15 side. And so you could see just the value of mobility would imply downside of 50% and upside of 100%. But this doesn't weigh the factors of eat, freight, autonomous, their equity stakes, um, how much cash they burn, because they're currently cash burning to a sizable degree. So for that sort of more detailed analysis, I will do an exclusive video on Uber just for Journey subscribers that I'll post later in December. And that's, that's sort of a broader thing. If you're interested in following my journey to try to find potential multibaggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Exclusive content like what I'm posting on Uber. There's also an educational series. I most One of the most recent educational posts was the secret behind billion dollar betting, which the reality is, or the billion dollar secret to betting, which I feel like most people don't know about, certainly most professional investors don't know like what is what is the right optimal betting approach? Um, I'm gonna put a catalog of content um, so you can see all the exclusive content, like what are our, what are the the names of each of the posts? You know, you can see if you want to click on what what my portfolio is as of you know November, you click on that. Um, and uh, there's also I'm gonna put a separate description of just each of my videos because I've noticed that several YouTube watchers, uh, subscribers are like, hey, Daniel, can you do a video on Nano X or can you take a look at Multiplan? And it's like, dude, I've already done that company, been there, done that, like check out this list. So I, I'll put a separate doc of just all the videos, alphabetical order, one company at a time. So you can check that. That'll be in the description of this video for you, my loyal YouTube subscribers. And the reality is just finding one potential multibagger can change your life journey. So if you're interested in following my journey to try to find those multibaggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. And if you enjoyed this video learning about Uber, I appreciate the subscription. I appreciate that thumbs up. And thank you so much for watching.